In today's video, we're gonna be discussing the Sabbat on the Wheel of the Year Yule, also referred to as the astronomical winter solstice. Plus, I'm baking some delicious cinnamon rolls, so do get yourself a nice warm drink, settle back, relax, and enjoy. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for joining me for today's video. I'm so excited about this video, and I said that about the Samhain video as well, but honestly, I think Samhain and Yule, the winter solstice, are my favorite Sabbaths, really. I mean, I've said that about so many Sabbaths, haven't I, really? I love this time of year. It is sort of in my soul, and I think so many witches and pagans and magical beings also feel the same. So it's really, really special, really, really powerful, and I think absolutely celebrating it in whatever way is authentic and feels true and honors your land and your spiritual paradigm philosophy I think is just perfect. So this series has really evolved this year and I've brought in more sources as I've gone on and so I would like to expand upon these as we go forward. It's a really really beautiful way to come back around and honor the seasons and really so many people now talk about creating your own wheel of the year and I think that's incredibly beautiful. Really looking at what the earth and nature is doing around you at each point in the year is really, really beautiful for cultivating your own practice. So I would really, really encourage that as well. But I also think it's lovely to learn more about the origins of the Sabbaths. I am planning to make a dedicated Wheel of the Year video to go into further depth about the Wheel of the Year and its conception. The Eight Sabbaths on the Wheel of the Year was conceived and put together by Aidan Kelly in 1973. And the Wheel of the Year was popularized in pagan and Wiccan circles mostly. However, many spiritual New Age practitioners, witches, pagans, do celebrate the Sabbaths on the Wheel of the Year as well. The Wheel of the Year is made up of four solar festivals, which include the two equinoxes, the spring and the autumn equinox, as well as the summer and winter solstice, which are astronomical events. And then the Celtic fire festivals, the primarily Irish Celtic fire festivals, were included as the cross quarter days. And these are known as the greater Sabbaths and solstices and equinoxes as the lesser Sabbaths. And it's not to suggest that they are less important, it's just a term that they got labelled with. And it's really important to understand that not all of these festivals would have been celebrated in every place at these specific times throughout the course of history. The wheel itself was put together as a contemporary concept to support pagans and witches and spiritual folks to honour the cycles of nature and the seasons within the year. However, each Sabbath festival celebration would have been celebrated differently by different people in different places at different times and not necessarily all of those would have been honoured. So it's really important to understand that there's nuance within each and every single Sabbath that we see. So with that little spiel out the way, and if you want to learn more in the meantime, there are lots of other YouTubers who've done videos, great videos about the Wheel of the Year, and also in my previous Sabbath videos I do talk a little bit about those. But for now, let's just get on into talking about Yule, or the Winter Solstice, or Midwinter. It's also referred to as Yuletide, so let's start with the astronomical aspects of this celebration being the winter solstice. Now the winter solstice, because it is an astronomical solar event, it happens at slightly different times each year. It can range between around the 21st and the 22nd each year really, it falls between. This year I believe the winter solstice is on the 21st of December at about 9.48pm GMT time. That's the British standard time in the winter. And essentially what the winter solstice marks is the shortest day of the year. So from this day onwards, the days are going to start to get longer and the nights are going to start to get shorter but this is the point of the longest night and the shortest day. So the word solstice actually means sun stand still and that is because the way that the sun is in the sky it's very low and it appears to move very very slowly and that is again due to the actual planet. So the earth because it is tilted and rotates on its axis with a slight tilt it means that we get the different seasons. The sun is really really low in the sky for that reason and so the sunlight, the warmth of the sun is spread across a really really broad amount of space which means that we get less warmth and less light. The word Yule in Norse traditions it is thought to mean wheel and refers potentially also to Odin's wheels or Woden's wheels on his chariot. There is also some speculation that the word Yule in Norse means feast. I'm not a Norse pagan myself so perhaps there are other people out there who can shed more light on this if they know more. I do believe I have Norse ancestry and so it is something I've looked into however I definitely have looked more into Irish paganism. The old Norse words were Yule 
with reference to the feast, and Yula, which I don't think I can say correctly, so I apologise. The word Yule also comes from the Old English Ghoul, G-E-O-L. In the Oxford English Dictionary, it is stated that Yule has been used since the 1800s. It refers to Odin's chariot. There is reference also made to the word joy and the word jolly. The historian Bede, who we have referenced in previous videos, recorded in 1726 CE that an old Anglican word, Yuli, is the name for December and January. So it's well documented there are a number of megalithic tombs and stones that were constructed in order to tell the time so that the light would shine at a certain point and that would be the point of the solstices. One of these is Newgrange in the Boyne Valley in Ireland. So at the point of the winter solstice, the rising sunlight shines through a passage at Newgrange. Ronald Hutton discusses these sites in great detail in Stations of the Sun and also discusses Stonehenge and how it's quite an exception to the other sites because it provides a setup for the summer solstice. One thing I think it is particularly interesting to note in Ronald Hutton's book is that with the discussion of different historical records he believes that beads historical recordings were more consistent and more accurate than that of Pliny's. Ronald Hutton makes particular reference to Pliny's confusion about the Druids' belief that mistletoe was a sacred plant. Ronald Hutton writes, he recorded, Pliny recorded, that the plant was regarded by the tribes of Gaul, modern France, as an antidote to poison and as a giver of fertility to animals. He added that it was treated by their druids or magical specialists as especially sacred when it was found growing on an oak, which it rarely does. Then it was richly gathered on the sixth day of the moon, a day upon which Pliny added these Gaelic tribes traditionally began their months and their years. A brief glance at this passage is sufficient to demonstrate that it does not describe a seasonal custom, but an ad hoc one, prompted by a rare botanical event and linked to the phases of the moon, not a solar calendar. Furthermore, Pliny specifically locates it in Gaul and not in Britain. So I love this book for this reason. This book is really, really helpful and interesting for this perspective to actually get like a historical context around these traditions and what we're looking at because I'm fairly certain that I've read in some pagan and witchy books that the druids considered mistletoe to be sacred but when we're looking at Ronald Hutton's work here we are actually getting a historical context around it to show that perhaps that's not quite so accurate, perhaps that's not the case. From that perspective I think it's really really helpful especially you know if you are interested in these specific pantheons or traditions. So Ronald Hutton does suggest that potentially the Anglo-Saxon recordings, historical recordings by Bede, are more accurate and more substantial. In 730, Bede records that one of the most prominent and important celebrations would have been Mother's Night, Modernacht. This was recorded in the Roman calendar as occurring on the 24th of December. I believe it may be celebrated on different dates in different areas. However, since then, Alexandra Tilly looked deeper into this in 1889, and what Tilly suggests is that perhaps Bede's understanding of this as being the most significant evening was not so accurate and this perhaps had more to do with the nativity and the mother giving birth to a son on that night. So it's really, really interesting, highly engaging, definitely a deep dive and really, really nice to take it in like little chunks, that's what I've been doing this year. Another writer, Snorri Sturlson in the 13th century also recorded the importance of the feasting at Yule and the harvest that had happened and that point being extremely vital and poignant for the next years bounty, crops, etc. And that therefore this was an incredibly important feast and one of great significance. So Ronald Hutton really concludes here that together with Bede's writing and Snorri's writing, you can really see how Yule is considered quite ancient in tradition for certain folks, those being Norse and Scandinavian, that it would have been a long feast spanning over several days, that it would have been highly important and that it was quite an old tradition. There's a topic I think that I dance around quite a lot that I think that when you talk about this time of year it's danced around a lot and it comes up a lot and it, that is the idea that the Christians stole all the pagan parts of Yule and turned it into what we now know as the Christmas that we see today and there is so much pagan celebration and tradition interwoven with our secular 
Christmas. And Christmas is secular as well as religious. You know, to some people it's both, and to some people it's one or the other. To some people they prefer not to celebrate it at all. Of course some religions don't celebrate it at all, and sometimes those people celebrate a secular version of it if they wish, and sometimes they do not. And again, that's entirely personal, but there is truth to the fact that there are pagan roots within what we see today as Christmas. So we're gonna take a little look at the origins of Christmas itself and how that came about. Again, looking at Ronald Hutton's work, on the very, very first page of the book, Ronald Hutton asserts that there is mythological value in the story of Christ's birth. However, it's not historically factual and it can't be. So here, Ronald Hutton says, the tales make sense on a mythological level, not merely as confirmations of a specifically Hebrew prophecy, but as archetypal representations of the birth of a hero. That being what we've seen from the pagan side of it, the light, which we will go into further depth in a bit, which then turns into the sun, Jesus. But how the records can't be historically true, the historical Jesus couldn't have been born in Bethlehem, Ronald Hutton asserts here that the accounts contradict each other. The fact that Christ the Redeemer, the birthplace was in Bethlehem, and that the Roman census and the massacre of the innocents then took place is, as Ronald Hutton states, historically implausible. There is no record in the New Testament of the exact date that Christ was born. And of course, different historians and writers tried to pinpoint the date. And most commonly, a date in spring was what was considered to be actual fact. So a calendar in Rome in 354 recorded it as being December 25th. And then that spread to Constantinople and Bethlehem, etc. And there's a Christian writer here that Ronald Hutton quotes the script to Cyrus in the late 4th century. It reads, it was a custom of the pagans to celebrate on the same 25th of December, the birthday of the sun, at which they kindled lights in token of the festivity. In these solemnities and revelries, the Christians also took part. Accordingly, when the doctors of the church perceived that the Christians had a leaning to this festival, they took counsel and resolved that the true nativity should be solemnized on that day. So, in short, and what is recorded in several other books as well that I've read on this topic, it was kind of decided by the church at a certain point that because the pagans, the people had been used to celebrating the return of the sun, solar sun, at this time, the return of the light, of hope, of a opportunity for renewal for the new year, the idea that the days would grow longer. Of course, at a time they wouldn't have known that necessarily, they might not have known, so it would have been about honouring that sun and worshipping that sun, that's when we come into talking about solar deities, which we will get to. So at that point they may not have known, so there was a lot of honouring that sun and its return. It would have been so sacred for them and so important for them to revel, to celebrate and to honour that sun. And that sun then becomes the light of Jesus, the light of God, God incarnate in flesh, who is born on Christmas. So it makes perfect sense because the people are used to celebrating at this time the return of the light and hope and renewal that they would place Jesus' birth at this time. It makes perfect sense. There is another thing that's really interesting here to note and that is that the actual pagan celebration at this time of year had not been traditional as such or recorded as traditional that much prior to this change. The Emperor Aurelian decreed in 274 that it was a major holy day of the new and syncretic state cult with the sun as its official chief deity. So it was actually historically a holiday and then it became a Christian holiday. So where did it all start? I think it's really interesting to think about how these mythological stories have evolved into different cultures. And there are several different mythological stories that came long before the Christian story of Jesus, and they are very similar. So there is belief that Horus, over 4,000 years ago, was the original deity that began this. Horus is one of these deities that may have been one of the first deities that was representative of the rebirth of the sun, of the light. Then there was Mithras. Mithras was Roman, but also spread to Greece and Persia and Egypt and Asia, and it was known as Natalius Solis Invicti, birthday of the invincible sun. So Mithras is a solar deity, and some scholars notably posit that worshipping cults of Mithras may have been nearly as widespread as Christianity is today. So there are many myths relating to Mithras that are very similar to our Christian myths around Jesus, so that he was born to a virgin mother, he was a child of God, that people pray for his return and eternal life. 
So it was in the fourth century then that the Church of Rome replaced the birth of the sun Mithras with the sun god, the birth of the sun, the Christian Jesus. And contemporary theologians agree that Jesus was born in the spring, as we have just seen. I think it's really, really interesting to look at these deities and to delve deeper into some of their stories because they are really, really interesting. And many, many people do work with deities like Orset or Isis. Okay, so it's a different day and <laughs> unhappily, I lost some of my footage. When I tried to upload my footage, it turned out that one of the files was corrupted, so it turned into a dat file. I don't know why it does that. But yeah, so I'm refilming part of the video, so do bear with me. So as we can see, the Christians, of course, co-opted the pagan beliefs around Mithras or other deities and turned those stories into Christ's stories. And similarly, we see that with Mother Mary because many of the stories echo that of stories of Isis or Oset and Kuan Yin even. So there is absolutely a parallel and it is not coincidental. So leading on from that, a theme that we actually do see throughout this Sabbath this time of year is the theme of mother and child and how sacred that was. What Ronald Hutton writes here is that he believes that the Anglo-Saxon historian Bede's writing is more substantially accurate than that of Pliny's. However, writing in 730, Bede's interpretation was that the most significant celebration was that of Maldronat, which is Mother's Night. Mother's Night was celebrated on the 24th in the Roman calendar. I believe in some areas it's celebrated on a different day and nowadays the 20th is, I believe, a day that is marked as Mother's Night. And this was traditionally a night where religious rites would take place and the mother would be honoured. However, much later in 1889, Alexandra Tilly actually makes the assertion that Bede's interpretation of this is skewed heavily and that he was actually interpreting the little evidence that he had to suggest that this was the most important evening when it's actually quite possible that the event itself was the nativity. So it's that mother and child relationship, the birth of Christ, the birth of the sun, the sun god, the return of the light, etc. Alexandra Tilly makes this assertion that what Bede is actually referencing was actually the nativity and that sacred birth from the mother of the divine child and that most likely that mother that was concerned is the Virgin Mary. His reasoning behind this was that Mogdronat was not recorded in any other literature. Until 1038, the Feast of Nativity was recorded as Midwinter. And it was in 877 when the 12 days of Christmas was marked as official holiday following Midwinter. So in Norse tradition, on Mother's Night, Mogdronat, is when everyone would stay up with the candles in honour of Freya and then Fraholder was to be celebrated on Yule. In the 11th century, we had Danish rule in England, and that's when the term Yule started to come in. So around these religious rites celebrating the nativity and the birth of the child and the mother and the child, that relationship, lights were really sacred and they were said to honour the virgin mother. And of course, this is a tradition that we can keep going. And just as we saw in Samhain, that idea of lighting a candle from another flame can also be seen in this Sabbath. I think that there's a reflection there, as with also the reverence of ancestors. For our ancient ancestors, they may not have known that the sun was going to return at a certain point, but even when they started to see that it did, they would have been wanting to revere the sun. There would have been a fear, I think, definitely a fear around death, being left out in the cold and needing to hunker down with loved ones and to cherish those moments and I think that's why celebration was so important and honouring that god, that sun god. And then of course that became Christ but there was still the same intention behind it, that intention to honour the sun but it was just a Christian sun. I actually do believe that the winter solstice is a really beautiful time to connect with ancestors because we are so close to them in terms of the darkness and being held in winter. It's so so cold and we are close to death. Because of the cold and freezing temperatures, of course, many would not survive if they did not have adequate sustenance and adequate shelter. 
and warmth for the winter. So our ancestors also would have been hunkering down and trying to conserve as much of their resources as they possibly could. So other than the celebration to be rationing, etc. And I think that the celebrations would have been much smaller than what we obviously have now. You know, when we saw the 12 days of Christmas come in after Christianity took over. So the feasts would have been a little bit more austere back then. But yeah, you have this connection to the earth as well but sort of going inward and this hunkering down this hibernating but then there's that darkness and there's that beautiful light and hope because out of darkness comes light and underground where it is dark is where the seed grows and sprouts as with a child is conceived within the woman of course you have that symbolism within this holiday baked right in with the virgin mother and the child and you know that's where life begins in darkness in the womb and I think there's something really sacred about that and we can see that theme reflected throughout the Sabbath. So of course there are so many customs at Christmas and many of them we have seen have derived from pagan roots. Most notably these roots are Norse and Roman. One of the most famous of these symbols is of course the Yule tree or now a Christmas tree and this is hugely popular nowadays of course at Christmas time. So the ancient Celts started honouring trees. They were seen as sacred and honoured with celebrations that came from the Norse invaders as well as the Druids. So it's thought that these evergreen trees were believed to be representations of the deities, the solar deities. And as a symbol of hope, because they were evergreen, they never lost their colour, they never lost their leaves, they still lived through the dark depths of winter. And so it was hope for renewal. And it was that idea of being rooted into the earth and also connecting to heaven, so that as above, so below, that made these trees so sacred. So it's said that Druids would have decorated their trees with wishes and charms for blessings for the new year and it was in Scandinavia where the trees were brought inside for the first time. The Christmas tree's origins are said to be in Rhineland, the earliest of which came from the 1520s. It was regularly then mentioned from 1789 until 1840. Prince Albert brought the Southern Germanic tradition from his country when he came over and married Queen Victoria, and then it started to take off in England. In Germany, children would sing around the Christmas tree, which is often something people do now, carols under the Christmas tree. It was only in the 1930s that Christmas trees began to appear in churches. Following the Americans after the Second World War, trees also started to appear in town centres and then in the 1950s it started to become a household custom. It was also a Celtic and a Norse tradition for herbs and spices to be thrown onto a bonfire or a hearth fire and that is again similar it's seen at Samhain that they would have done this and again I believe it is lifting up prayers on the incense, the smoke to the deities as well as to put in those wishes, those prayers for blessings for the next years, crops etc. Anthropologist E.W. Budge believes that Yule was celebrated as a festival 12,000 years ago and some say earlier still. So in neo-pagan lore, which is also popularised by the Wiccan tradition, there are the two gods that are part of one and the same god, and it is the Oak King and the Holly King, and they are part of the one Wildwood God. And we see the battle between these two kings throughout the Wheel of the Year, and the Wheel of the Year kind of reflects this as the goddess becomes the mother, a form of which is also the lover, and the god who dies and then is reborn. So on Yule is when the Oak King then defeats the Holly King again and takes the crown as we come into the light half of the year and it is at the summer solstice that the Holly King of course triumphs over the Oak King leading us into the dark period of the year. So it's believed that this mythology which there are many rituals around actually derives from the Druids which kind of makes sense to me considering the sacredness of the trees. There has also been some comparisons from the Holly King to Father Christmas as well, or parallels between the two figures. So the Holly King and the Oak King are said to be one and the same, of course, they are two sides of the same god. And this is said to be inspired by the Wren and the Robin. There is an old rhyme recorded in Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bough, and it goes as follows. We hunted the wren for Robin the Bobbin. We hunted the wren for Jack of the Can. We hunted the wren for Robin the Bobbin. We hunted the wren for everyone. 
So the wren was hunted on Christmas Day and on the following St. Stephen's Day. So arguably we could say that because the Christians did co-opt much of the pagan traditions, it has actually kept alive many of these traditions, which is also kind of beautiful. And many people do choose to celebrate both. Many people just celebrate one or the other. Many people don't celebrate either. And that's absolutely fine, whatever you believe. There were, of course, opportunities to honor other deities as well. There was a St. Catherine's Week this was a Catholic tradition and essentially the wheel was rolled down a hill with a burning human effigy and it reminds me somewhat of the tradition in earlier points in the year as well and it's again that just honouring the sun god with the burning wheel and that wheel of course is symbolic of the sun turning of course you have the name Yule and then there's the wheel of the year so it all kind of comes together. There was also Saturnalia Saturnalia was a Roman holiday honouring the god Saturn or Cronus. It was in the 17th century that the Greek author Lucian wrote, let every man be treated equal, slave and freeman, poor and rich. Saturnalia was intended to be, in the Roman calendar, a feast of preparation ahead of the merriment at the main celebration. It began on the 17th of December. A latter feast calendar ran from the 1st to the 3rd of January, and this was intended to be a time of completion and rounding out. It was in 153 BCE that Saturnalia began, and it was common for people to choose a king and for there to be lots of misrule, and this then led to the Lords of Misrule rule and the kings of misrule. The lords of misrule were very popular during the middle ages. It was recorded in a number of publications. In 1791, one in Hertfordshire, the Gentleman's Magazine noted that an activity called wassailing was accompanied by a lot of shouting. And it was also recorded that many of these wassailing celebrations included fires, as well as cider, the wassail, and that it was actually poured onto trees to bless the trees, to thank them for the crop, and to, again, like call in the new bounty for the year to come. Wassailing occurred on the 12th eve of Christmas. It was Robert Herrick writing in the 1630s that recorded of wassailing the fruit bearing trees in order to ensure good yields. And in the 1660s and 1670s, a Sussex clergyman gave money to the boys who came to howl his orchard. So one of the wassails went as follows. Here's to the old apple tree, whence thou mayest bud, and whence thou mayest blow, and whence thou mayest bear apples and oh, hats full, caps full, bushel, bushel, sacks full, and my pockets full too, huzzah. There are a number of variations as well from different regions. In the 1570s, Thomas Tusser also recorded a number of rhymes and songs that were sung in celebration at this time. Many were sailing tunes. So, wassail, wassail, out of the milk pail, wassail, wassail, as white as my nail, wassail, wassail, in snow, frost and hail, wassail, wassail, that much doth avail, wassail, wassail, that never will fail. So this tradition, a Christmas tide activity, first described by Peter de Langcroft writing in the 1320s, and the leader of a gathering took a drink and cried wassail. The host of a gathering would grab a cup or a bowl of alcoholic beverage wassail and would cry wassail, Old English for your health. So that person was answered, drink hail, drank from it and passed to the next of the company with a kiss and then repeated this action. This custom became more and more flamboyant and was recorded by the Londoner Henry Machen when a guest at a party at Henley on Thames on 12th Eve 1555 into the room came 12 wassails with maidens singing with their wassails and after came the chief wives singing with their wassails and the gentlewoman had ordained a great table of banquets, desserts of spices and fruit as marmalade, gingerbread, jelly, comfit, sugar plate and divers others. Wow. So this then became a little bit of a custom and people would go from house to house with wassail. Nicholas Breton in 1602 wrote of how hearty welcome fills the wassail bowl and George Wither in 1618 when he wrote of the wealthy people who aid the poor once a year and entertain their Christmas wassail bowls. John Taylor in 1631 described how a company of maids would call at a rural household at Christmas crying wassail wassail jolly wassail and bringing cakes and a bowl of drink. In return they would be given white bread, cheese and minced pies. 
The wassail is kind of similar in a way to the mumming, to the clemencing, the idea of begging in a sense, and we see that as well at Samhain of course with trick-or-treating, that what has come in to be trick-or-treating. I believe the idea derived from Catholicism and St. Catherine, and it was similar to that souling. So there were rhymes, clemony, clemony, clemony mine, a good red apple and a pint of wine, some of your mutton and some of your veal. If it is good, pray give me a deal. If it is not, pray give me some salt. Butter, butler, butler, fill your bowl. If thou fillst it of the best, the Lord will send your soul to rest. If thou fillst it of the small, down goes butler, bowl and all. And there are several other versions as well. I would read them to you, but I will be here all day. There is carol singing, of course, as well, and that is said to be derived from the wassailing, and the custom is quite similar. So there is a record here on Christmas Eve in 1759, a young girl at Wootton Warren in Warwickshire's Forest of Arden saw two tall women call at her grandmother's house, carrying between them a large wassail bowl, finely dressed on the outside with holly mistletoe, ribbons, lustrous, and other flowers that could be had at that season. The brew inside offered was a pretty silver cup, and the women sang a long carol. Female were sail bearers remained in the rule a song in Warwickshire went as follows a jolly was sail bowl a was sail of good ale well fair the butler's soul that settleth this to sail our jolly was sail good dame here at your door our was sail we begin we are all maidens poor we pray now let us in with our was sail our was sail we do fill with apples and with spice then grant us your good will to taste here once or twice of our good was sail and of course there are more and slowly then carols came in. In 1871, Magdalen College, Oxford published Christmas carols, old and new. Then in 1880, Edward Benson, who would later become the Archbishop, devised the basic modern Christmas service, the festival of nine lessons in carols. And the carols, O Come All Ye Faithful, was translated into English from the French in 1840, while Shepherds Washed and Hark the Herald Angels Sing had Georgian words for Victorian tunes, and all the rest were products of the mid and late 19th century. The old examples, lovingly collected by the antiquarians, remains fossilised in learned tomes. As people flocked to the new carol services, the remaining village singers gave up and the last seven weights had their license revoked. So then really carol singing became the big thing and the wassailing kind of trickled out. Again you can see how the Christian church is sort of taking over and taking the place of that more pagan tradition of the wassailing. And I suppose by pagan really what you could glean from that is that it was pagan because it wasn't Christian just because it was secular. So you could say that the secular today is our paganism, arguably. But obviously, of course, not everyone is pagan. Not suggesting that. Ronald Hutton also records that in 1752, in Sussex and Surrey, the performers of dances and mummers would commonly wrap trees with the sticks and sometimes splashed ale on them. In the West, they often fired guns over them, splashed cider of them, and put cider-soaked cakes on bread in branches. There were also traditions of setting a old Meg alight, an effigy, as well as many Morris dancing, mummers, plays, performances, etc. So there's so many things going on. You also have the idea of the 12 days of Christmas and this was a time that is recorded by Thomas Tusser expressed in the mid 16th century that at Christmas we banquet with the rich with the poor who then but the miser but openeth his door and the idea was that the rich were to open their doors to the poor and really what's believed to have occurred is that rich people would have hosted for people slightly below their station. It is however recorded that Henry Rogers, mayor of Coventry in 1517, seems genuinely to to have kept open house for all. There is a very old rhyme, the 13 Yule Days, which is said to have inspired the 12 days of Christmas. Day one, a papping go. Day two, three partridges. Day three, three plovers, a game bird. Day four, a grey goose. Day five, three starlings. Day six, three gold sphinx. Day seven, a brown bull. Day eight, three merry ducks are laying. Day nine, three swans are merry swimming. Day 10, an Arabian baboon. Day 11, three hinds, hounds, merry hunting. Day 12, three maids, merry dancing. And day 13, three stalks of corn. Of course I mentioned St Catherine's Wheel, there is of course St Stephen's Day, there's mention of Eve of the Feast of Mary, so you have a lot of other saints and figures being celebrated and there's lots to go into, there's so much here, I couldn't possibly discuss everything and I couldn't retain it all either, so I will be rereading this like every year, it's so interesting. 
Of course, all the food, all the feasting, and Ronald Hutton describes that the decades between 1610 and 1650 were really the first detailed evidence of a popular association of special foods and drinks at the season. So one of them was a minced pie, which was a mixture of actual mince meat, fruit and spices baked in a pastry case. The spices were said to preserve the meat, so that is why you, you had the meat in that. But then of course, then they removed the meat and now it's much more customary to have your mince pies without the meat and to just have the dry fruits and the spices in it. It's delicious. I make mince pies pretty much every year. It's been a favourite of mine to do since I was a child. I always put magic into it. It's always really special and really lovely. I have my own recipe for minced meat and my own recipe for the pastry that I use and I've been doing it that way for, well, since my early 20s really. Another recorded here was plum porridge thick beef broth with prunes, raisins, and currants stirred into it. Among meat dishes, beef and brawn, both stuck with rosemary, were especially favoured. The seasonal drink was hot spiced ale with apples floating in it, and would be commonly known in the 19th century as lamb's wool. And these would remain standard for the next 200 years. So then of course there is the greenery, and there is much around holly and ivy, of course you probably know the holly and the ivy, the folk song. John Stowe recalling, in old age, the London of Henry the A asserted that every man's house was decked with holly and ivy at the season and a 15th century poem directed nay ivy nay it shall not be i wis let holly have the master as the manner is holly stood in the hall fair to behold ivy stood without the door she is full sore cold so the idea was that holly was fastened in the interior and ivy in the porch a late medieval writer produced a christmas carol holver and hay which embodied a belief that Holly represented the male and Ivy the female, and the song contest breaks out between them. Holly and Ivy made a great party, who should have the master in lands where they go. Then spake Holly, I am fierce and jolly, I will have the master in lands where we go. Then spake Ivy, I am loud and proud, and will have the master in lands where we go. Then spake Holly, and set him down on his knee, I pray thee gentle Ivy, say me no villainy in lands where we go. So then this kind of went in and out of tradition with history as we had different monarchs and there's a lot to go into there. In the early 1600s, George Wither said that each room with ivy leaves is dressed and every post with holly. In 1629, the botanist Parkinson identified yew and box as other Christmas greenery and Robert Henrik, writing between the 1620s and the 1630s, listed holly, ivy, rosemary, bay and at last mistletoe as other favourites. John Aubrey wrote that we dress our house at Christmas with bays and hang up in the hall or etc a mistletoe bough. And by the late 18th century, mistletoe had become known as the kissing bush. So foliage with which to kiss beneath. And so this custom stayed strong really across the board and Washington Irving in a short story Christmas Day in 1819 gave his readers a romantic frisson by suggesting that it was a pagan plant beloved of the druids and never trusted by the church. In reality church wardens accounts prove that it was employed in church decoration from that time and it became fashionable in the 17th century. Again you have that idea that probably comes all the way from Pliny, that notion that the mistletoe would have been sacred to the Druids, when actually it's considered that it's more likely that it was a one-off event and not something of great significance. But it really, I believe, probably has become, if you believe in thought forms, egregores, that kind of thing, I believe that it probably has become quite sacred to Druids at this time. And for great reason, I think, if things are written down, even if they weren't necessarily fully accurate, they have relevance and meaning today. And then by the 19th century, it was really common to have a Yule log. Of course, you needed fuel for your fire, so you would select a Yule log, a Yule clog in Devon, also a Yule block in the West Midlands in the West Country. Ronald Hutton writes here that it's believed that it was first recorded in Britain by Robert Herrick, writing in the 1620s or 1630s, and he called it a Christmas log. He portrayed it as being brought to the farmhouse by cheering lads, whom the farmer's wife were rewarded with a drink that they could take. He also commented that the presence of the log was thought to bring prosperity, and that it was lighted to music with the remnant of last year's one. The latter, he added, was believed to protect the home from evil if laid up there safely during the intervening months. What Ronald Hutton suggests here is that this has been a custom that has actually been going on for quite a while and probably established since the early Stuart period and most likely in Devon. So the Yule Logger was of course an ancient symbol, many associate it with a phallus. It was traditionally said to be made from oak, brought inside and treated, it would be lit, three holes for the candles would represent the three faces of the goddess, 
and hopes, wishes and blessings for the new year would be wished upon it, tied upon it with cloth. I add paper wishes to mine, brown paper wishes. You could also add charms for protection. It was also said to represent the body of the goddess, the Kaliak. It was then engulfed in the flames, similar to that Catherine's wheel with the effigy of the human, and it was said to bring back the light. It was customary to anoint it with oils and greenery and to light it with the prayers and wishes. And in the 17th century, Henry Bourne suggested that this might have been a tradition from the Anglo-Saxon fire ceremony of winter solstice. And Sir James Fraser added it to his collection of punitive pagan fire rit rituals from ancient Europe. So again, you have this kind of conjecture, when did this tradition actually start? And the more you delve deep in, into this, the more you're like, oh, actually, no one really knows. <laughs> but it's so interesting to look at all of the historic records that we have. And Ronald Hutton really does a great job of like going into all of it. And I could never sum it up for you. So I really, really highly recommend that you read Stations of the Sun. And it's believed that around the 19th century is when the Yule Log started to sort of vanish a little bit, became less popular. But it's believed that it was still burnt in many areas of Devon. That's where I live. In the 1950s and the 1960s, it's very, very popular as a tradition for pagans and witches. Of course you have the Jingle Bells and they are a Norse tradition. You have the Germanic Saint Nicholas who would bring children gifts and leave them in their shoes I believe on the 6th of December. You also have the Jewish Hanukkah Festival of Light. You have the West African celebration of Kwanzaa also a festival of light, I believe. There is also the Swedish Tomt who is a gift-giving gnome that's quite cute. So how could we talk about Christmas without talking about Charles Dickens and A Christmas Carol? A favourite of many. I have read this book several times. It is lovely and also kind of scary. I've seen many adaptations. My favourite being The Muppet Christmas Carol, which my husband and I watch every year. I'm sure you have seen it. And there have been some amazing adaptations as well. There was one with Guy Pearce a few years ago on the BBC in the UK, so you probably will be able to watch that. In 1843, Charles Dickens published A Christmas Carol, and of course it had a huge impact on what we know Christmas to be today. It was a revolutionary story because it really spoke to how the time should be kept as sacred and special and holy and beautiful and all about love and feasting and joy. So here Ronald Hutton writes, Christmas as portrayed by Dickens invested materialism with a spiritual quality which enabled the newly rich to enjoy their wealth. Within one year, the book sold 15,000 copies and the following Christmas it was dramatised at nine London theatres. It has subsequently been adapted for stage and screen more than any other of Dickens's work. There is, of course, the popular poem The Night Before Christmas by Clement Seymour. This is said to have been inspired in 1809. Washington Irving, whose sentimental interest in traditional Christmases had been mentioned, drew attention to the old tradition in his Knickerbocker's History of New York, rescheduling it from St. Nicholas's Eve to Christmas Eve. Irving's portrait was repeated in an 1821 issue of The Children's Friend, published in the same city, and that may have been the direct inspiration to another New Yorker, Clement Clark Moore, to create the modern Santa. It was in 1980 that the academic Rogan Taylor speculated that Santa Claus may have been derived from Siberian shamanism. The idea that he flies through the air like a shaman, his reindeer resemble the reindeer spirits of the Siberian tribes, his robes are red and white like the hallucinogenic fly agaric mushrooms, which the shamans consume to enter trances and comes down the chimneys like Siberians entering and leaving the home by the smoke hole in their dwellings. Whilst he did suggest this, he also said that it's quite likely that it didn't, but it is an interesting parallel and comparison, one that I have heard others talk about as well. I want to share with you my recipe for these delicious cinnamon rolls. They were absolutely divine and the kids absolutely loved them and yeah, it had a little bit of Christmas in them as well because I added just a little touch of Christmas. So I hope you enjoy that. We're baking again. We're making cinnamon rolls, my C love. Cinnamon rolls. We need to measure up 350 grams of this plain flour, darling. Okay. Okay, so we hold it together. Isn't that many okay? Nearly 330. That, we're there, 350. That's it. So, 50 grams of sugar. Yeah, 50. Can you tip it, Mummy? Yeah. Do you want to have a go? Yeah. Rose is making a Christmas list. Wonderful. Just yeah. stir it around. That's right. Okay, clockwise. And think about the beautiful blessings. Can you make a wish, Gabriel, in your head? Okay. I wish 
I was a robot. <laughs> <laughs> so for these blessed or festive cinnamon raisin rolls, you'll need 350 grams of plain flour, 50 grams of sugar, half a teaspoon of salt, 175 mils of milk, 8 grams of yeast, 50 grams of butter, and one large egg at room temperature. I'll do some magic You're going to do some magic? So as with all of my recipes, I'm always imbuing my intentions throughout. I'm measuring out 100 grams, so you tell me when it's at 100. So here we're measuring out 100 grams of raisins for the filling. Right, do you want to add the sugar? Sorry? Add the sugar and make a wish. Stir the sugar in. Make your wish. Um, We're going to put a bit of salt in as well. Just a little pinch because we are actually going to use salted butter. Ideally, you have unsalted. Just a pinch of salt. I wish I was a beautiful flower. <laughs> you are a beautiful flower. Are you a beautiful flower? Yeah. So I have milk here, 175 mils of milk, and I've got 50 grams of butter, and I'm gonna melt this together and add the yeast. So when I'm making bread, I really like to use my hands, and that is a primary way that I imbue my intention. So I like to push my energy through using my hands and imbue my intention, as well as using the spoon almost as a wand. I also chant over it, which I don't really share. I blow into it, and I also like to stir sigils into my baking as well. So now I'm going to add the yeast to the lukewarm milk, and I'm just gonna sprinkle it in. This is about eight grams, so it's sort of two teaspoons. Rosalie, would you like to give it a little stir? To the right, that's it, clockwise. What would you wish for our family for Christmas, for Yule? Can you make your wish, darling? Yeah. You're so pretty. This is yeast, and we need to let it sit for a minute. So once the yeast has sit, I am then also adding a whisked up egg at room temperature, uh, along with the yeast and milk to the flour mixture. And just mix it all together, bring it together, and it will be a really wet dough. And so your hands might get quite sticky. You can use a little bit of oil if you like, or I'm just adding a little bit of flour just to stop the stickiness. But try not to add too much flour because you don't want to change the consistency of the dough. And you just want to knead it for, 10 minutes. So I am just letting the dough rest, proving for about 15 minutes or so. Probably be longer than that, probably be more like 20 minutes, but I don't want to overprove it. And then I have some butter here for the filling. So I'm gonna add some cinnamon first. I'm gonna do two teaspoons. A teaspoon of this pumpkin spice. This has cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg and cloves in it. If you can't find this, you can go ahead and use like a ground mixed spice. Make sure it's not five spice, it's for savoury dishes. Use the one for sweet dishes. A teaspoon of vanilla extract because I'm obsessed with vanilla in all of my desserts. It has to happen. Just don't want too much because it's quite liquidy. Light brown sugar, 70 grams. literally smells like Christmas. I'm gonna add raisins, 100 grams. These are actually sultanas because we couldn't find raisins, but it's fine. It smells amazing. So this actually ended up proving for about 30 minutes, I think. So I'm just rolling it out and um, making a sort of rectangular oblong shape about 25 to 30 centimeters if you can but essentially you want it to be sort of about half an inch ish thick and then you want to spread your mixture across the dough and roll it up and form your beautiful buns. I'm of course taking my time to imbue my intention again as with every step and I really just enjoyed this part of it because it's really really fun. 
then you want to slice up your buns and then you want to arrange them in your lined and greased baking dish. I just have a 20 centimeter square. And then I'm gonna leave these to prove again for another hour and a half to two hours. And here they are, and they're doubled in size, looking so yummy, I cannot wait. Next, I'm making the icing, and I'm gonna be using 100 grams of icing sugar, 30 grams of butter, 125 grams of cream cheese, one teaspoon of vanilla extract, I'm stirring this in, blessings for our family, prosperity, and manifesting with this. Then I'm just going to add a little bit of liquid Christmas. This is Grand Monnier. It's like an orange liqueur. It's really delicious. Two tablespoons. This is optional, of course. Here is the gorgeous icing. So the cinnamon rolls baked in the oven for about 20 to 25 minutes at 170 degrees Celsius. Of course, every oven varies, so do what you think is right for your oven. <laughs> Can't do it. So cute. I really, really hope you enjoyed seeing how I made those and do give them a go. They are so good this time of year, especially if you're not really a mince pie kind of person or a Christmas cake kind of person. They're really, really perfect dessert for Christmas day. And I really felt like the icing was quite a lot like sort of brandy butter kind of style. So if, if Christmas pudding, Christmas cake isn't your thing, I would really, really recommend these. They are so, so good. So I do have some books that I'm going to recommend to you, but first I want to show you this. This is a really old book for you all that I've had for a long time. This is by Dorothy Morrison. I believe this was released in the early 2000s. And one thing I love about this is that it goes through all of the symbols that we have and traditions like the poinsettia, and it talks about the origins of all of it, which I love. And another aspect of this that I love is that there's a section on folk superstitions. So there's weather here. The weather on each of the 12 days of Christmas foretells the weather for each calendar month in the coming year. For example, if the first day of Christmas is bitterly cold, the month of January will be bitterly cold. If snow doesn't fall on Christmas, the following Easter would be cold. A breezy Christmas day brings good luck throughout the coming year. The summer harvest will be abundant if the night sky on Christmas is clear and starry. You also have some folk beasts here. In Sweden, it's believed that the trolls travel freely through the countryside from dusk on Christmas Eve until dawn on Christmas morning. For this reason, it is common practice in Sweden to stay indoors during those hours. Legend has it that animals can speak on Christmas Eve. Don't listen to them though. Same legend says it's unlucky for you to hear them. So with food and consumables, if your friends are important to you, you must eat plum pudding during the holidays. Otherwise you will lose a friend before next Christmas. To ensure good fortune in the coming year, Christmas cakes must remain uncut until December 24th. Even then, one piece must remain uneaten until after Christmas Day. After eating supper on Christmas Eve, leave a loaf of bread on the table. This guarantees plenty of bread in the household for the coming year. There are similar folk superstitions for New Year's as well, which I think is so lovely and beautiful. And I love that these are really simple things that you can actually bring into your own practice and imbue your magic into and turn into magic for the season. On Christmas Eve in England, it's common practice for unmarried girls to knock on the hen house door. She'll be married within the next 12 months if a rooster answers her by crowing. Want to see your future lover? Just toss 12 sage leaves on Christmas Eve winds to make the image materialise. So there are many like this. I think it's so interesting. So this is this book. You can probably get it secondhand. Dorothy Morrison is great. This was a fantastic read. I got this years ago and I still love it. So let's go into some correspondences. I'm just going to read my list that I've compiled. Pine cones, bay, holly, mistletoe, gold, frankincense, myrrh, cedar, pine, rosemary, yarrow, willow bark, poinsettia, known as the flower of the holy night, valerian, ginger, nutmeg, cinnamon, cloves, allspice, star anise, cardamom, peppercorns, vanilla, citrus fruits and peel, chestnuts, apples, pickles, red cabbage, lactase, that's a Jewish potato pancake, 
raisins, cranberries, popcorn, cider, mulled wine, orange, clementines, sherry, brandy, rum, port, ale, eggnog, gingerbread, sultanas, raisins and other preserved fruits, I mentioned raisins, peppermint, chocolate, bells, candles, wreaths, elves, Christmas cards, the origins of which are said to be by Sir Henry Cole in England in 1843. So some deities that you can work with on this season, this is not an exhaustive list, I wish it was, but it's not. Ra, Egyptian, Apollo, Greek, Horus, Egyptian, Sol, Roman, Mithras, Roman, Frau Holder, Germanic, Vicaliac, Freya, Norse, the Morrigan, Irish, Frigg, Norse, Scaldi, Scandinavian, Alkyon, I don't know if I said that right, Greek, Saturn or Kronos, Jupiter, Odin, Woden, Dionysus, Jesus, Mother Mary, Isis or Set, Janus, the Green Man, Robin or Jack in the Green, the Green King, myths of King Arthur, Santa Claus, Kris Kringle, the Holy King, Kununos, then some other beasts include reindeer, and they're linked to Odin, Krampus, the Yule Goat, Ebenezer Scrooge from A Christmas Carol, St. Lucia, which is Swedish, and of course some others that I've mentioned within the video that I haven't added to this list as well, so there's so many. So some ideas for celebrating, of course there are so many things that I'm repeating from video to video because of course you can bake, of course you can do crafts, so this is my list. Baking cakes and treats, gingerbread houses, mince pies, Christmas cake, Christmas pudding, plum pudding, cinnamon rolls which is what I'm making, making and eating soups, getting comfy in lots of Christmas sweaters, roaring fires, toasting marshmallows, having hot chocolate with marshmallows, reading lots of books, hunkering down and hibernating, decorating with natural decorations and to forage for them as well, as just be sure you are not foraging for you because it is poisonous, so be sure that you are foraging for other evergreens such as spruce pine, decorating a tree. There is of course the debate about what is best, real or faux. Of course cutting down trees isn't ideal, neither is the disposal of it. However, if you are going to an actual Christmas tree farm, they are replanting all the time and that is providing important oxygen for our planet. Fake trees create a lot of waste and pollution to make, but also in the same breath if you have one faux tree for the rest of your life, that is one tree and you're not cutting down lots of other trees. There is a debate for each side and one lovely answer I think is to get a tree in a pot which is something I'm planning to do. We can't do it this year because we're going away for Christmas. It's something I'd like to do. However, I have heard from several people that they don't like to come inside if they are used to living outside. So I don't know from any experience of my own if that is something that is true. Do let me know if you have a Christmas tree in a pot that you have outside and bring inside. I'd love to hear your experiences. You can of course make your own Christmas baubles and enchant them. I have made my own in previous years before. I put wishes for manifesting blessings, abundance, friendship, love, just home blessings really, the joy in the family home. I actually created a video doing this with my daughter a few years ago on my previous channel, which I will link it below. I've thought about re-uploading it here. If you're interested in that, let me know. Of course you can perform a tree blessing on your tree as well. Then there's the Yule Log, which is so fun to do. I love doing this. Wassailing, make a mulled wine or a mulled cider or a spice drink or wassail, which there are recipes for in some of the books I'm gonna share. Carol sing, wassail with the wassail and parade around, go door to door if you have friends, neighbors. Of course, kissing beneath the mistletoe, which we discussed. Carol singing again, which I mentioned. There's the theme of goodwill to all men. Go to see Santa with your kids. I have kids, this is really important. Ice skating, of course. We're going to see some reindeer today, which I'm very excited about. Donating your time or your money or gifts, of course, to charity. You can volunteer at a soup kitchen or on Christmas day. That is something that's really, really valuable. Feasting, of course, guising and dressing up divination for the year ahead, parties, parades and celebrations, lots and lots of drinking and feasting, eating delicious foods we've discussed, Morris dances, lots and lots of lights, gift giving of course, crafts, crafting decor, wreaths which is so much fun, making candles, making bath salts and gifts, making fudge and sweet treats to gift to people, peppermint bark etc, chocolates, making paper garlands, popcorn garlands, drying slices of oranges and creating decorations out of that, so beautiful. Storytelling of course, this is a real Irish custom and something that's really really sacred to the Irish tradition is storytelling. 
So of course you can perform uh, winter divination as I discussed, winter cleansing and protection. I am currently refreshing all of my altar spaces and I wish I could show you this room, it is a state. I attempted to film some of my witches, apothecary and witchy spaces a month or so ago and I have not finished it yet because the room is so full of Christmassy things, stuff that we still haven't put away since we moved and then my altar space is a mess and I've just so many books I cannot fit on my bookshelf and it's kind of messy in here so that's a big project for me so that refreshing of course you can use snow and ice if it is snowy and icy near you. You can use that in your spells. Harvest some and freeze it and use it when you want. You can use moon water at this time as well. Make offerings to the earth and to nature. Of course be careful with what you are offering. If you are pouring libations that are alcoholic, don't pour them straight onto the earth. Of course don't put salt out and there are certain foods like chocolate that is harmful to animals as well. So just be really mindful about that and do your research. Of course you can make offerings to the land spirits as well. You can as I said, make gifts for people, chutneys, preserves, fudges or sweets, crafts, decorations, bath salts, host a ritual with friends, family, stay up all night with the candles blazing. You're going to be very tired though if you have kids, so I would recommend don't do this if you have kids. Working with a deity that you're close to or one from the list if it calls to you, saying prayers, talking to your ancestors, going over memories, photo albums, stories from the family. It's really, really beautiful to do at this time of year, especially because now is the time when we're with our families a lot and we're remembering those who are no longer with us. Honouring the ancestors as ours would have done at this time. Creating an altar to the sun, God and to the light. Reading your favourite Christmas book, Little Women or A Christmas Carol and watching adaptations of those beautiful plays, productions and films as well. So lovely to do all of these things at this time of year. And I have been talking for such a long time. I really, really hope I've touched on everything I wanted to talk about. There's so much and so much more to go into. I hope I've given you a little bit of a taste of some of the ways in which you can celebrate. So I'm briefly going to share with you some books that I have read over the years that I do think are really, really great to read and really helpful and supportive for understanding more about the season. The book that I read this year was this book. This is the new Yule book from the Llewellyn Sabbath series, the Rituals, Recipes and Lore for the Winter Solstice. And this is written by Susan Pesnecker. So this is part of the series and I have a few of them now. I've read a few of them. I've enjoyed them and I would like to get the others as well and have like a complete collection. I would recommend them. They are quite small, but one thing I think is lovely about them is they have so many lovely recipes in them. And just just like sort of a nice overview. Rituals that you can do and just some fantastic ideas. There's a really great recipe in here for eggnog that I really want to try. Oh my gosh. So I would highly recommend. I think this book is a must read for every pagan and witch. It's the Stations of the Sun and I've been referencing this through most of this year for the Sabbaths and really, really enjoying. I'm going to be rereading it, I think, for several years to come because there's so much in here. It's rich, engaging, so much history and knowledge and, yeah, wealth of understanding. Couldn't recommend it more highly. As I showed you earlier, this Dorothy Morrison Yule book is lovely as well. There's some beautiful recipes in here that are different from the other book. There's a dragon layer cake, which is Irish. Crescent cakes. Oh my gosh, they sound amazing. A Yule log, of course. I love making Yule log. I've made Yule log for years. Solar candy, Yule cookies, gingerbread cookies. Delicious. There's gifts that you can make. There's different rituals, ornaments, traditions and customs from around the world. I really like this. Then there's The Witch's Wheel of the Year. I really like this book by Jason Mankey. Obviously Jason writes from a Wiccan perspective so the rituals in here are quite Wiccan based but there's an individual ritual as well as a coven ritual so I think if you are in a coven this is a great book to have. Again, the rundown about the Sabbaths are quite minimal but really references the important things. So I think this is a great book to get if you want sort of an all rounder. Circle Round, I always talk about this book, Raising Children in Goddess Traditions, lovely stories, songs, recipes, etc. So I'd highly recommend this for crafts, etc. with children. There's a song about the rebirth of the sun and a story about the rebirth of the sun, a visit to Mother Winter, the story of Amaterasu, a Japanese deity. You've got wish bread here, it's like monkey bread. You've got the Yule Elves, Christmas tree decorations, a holly wreath. So lovely things that you can do with your children and stories that you can read together. 
This one is a new book to me. So I've read the Samhain section and the Yule section in this book. This is Sabbaths by Eden McCoy. This is good. It goes into quite a bit, a lot of depth, but again, it is coming from a witchy pagan perspective. So I, again, would reference this with Ronald Hutton's Stations of the Sun, but I've enjoyed this so far. There is, of course, this book as well. In the Irish, Mean Gemrich, you have deities such as the Dagda and Brigid being honored. So you've got yellow cedar, ash, bay laurel, blessed thistle, chamomile, frankincense, holly, juniper, mistletoe, and pine. I mentioned most of those earlier in the herbal correspondences that I had, but what I love about this book is that it does go into detail about the herbs that it uses. So you can actually use this from a herbal witchcraft perspective. So if you want to use some of these herbs in some spells or rituals, then it's a really, really nice reference book to have. And then I always reference The Noble Art, and this is more for myself, for a kind of psycho-spiritual reflection. And I've been working with this book this year, and I plan to work with it for the next few years as well, because each section I still could go deeper. And I feel like that's definitely the way with shadow work, you start, you start sort of peeling away the layers and then you realize there's more. So Yule and the Winter Solstice is part one, December 21st to January 31st is the first cycle from risk to release. So it's that risk, that fear of the darkness and then release being the return of the light. So as below you have the risk and as above you have the release. And the synthesizing of it is a place within the tribe, victory of order over chaos and the rebirth of the light. Really what I felt that I was getting from this was this focus on being with the people that are yours, your tribe. Because again, there's that fear of abandonment as well as the death aspect. So the shadow aspect that Tiffany Lasik really pinpoints here is neglect and form of abandonment and this fear and what our inner child really needs, the divine child. So it's kind of looking at these shadow aspects of ourselves, how these things have been formed, addictions that we may have formed as kind of coping mechanisms for fears that we had of abandonment, etc. as a child. And working with that, I feel the inner child. And so that was something that was really important for me to go into. So there's so much work to do here that takes you deeper into the themes of the Sabbath. And you can really analyze them from a psycho-spiritual perspective in a really personal way. I find it really, really poignant. And I do really, really recommend this. Now, I've been working with this for the year. I really, really recommend this to anyone who's kind of disillusioned a little bit by Sabbath, the usual pagan witchy Sabbath books that say the same things. Some of the things I've talked about today, you know, if you're sick of these videos even, this is the book that I think would really support you. And Tiffany's first book, The Great Work, I don't have that book, but I believe if it's anything like this, it would be amazing. And I've heard amazing things about it. It's something I plan to get after this one. Lots and lots to chew on here. I really, really hope that this has been valuable. I really, really hope that it's been enjoyable. I hope that you enjoyed the recipe. Do let me know if you create this recipe or if you alter it or do your own. I'd love to hear as well. So send me pictures or comment below. If you made it to the end of the video, leave me a Christmassy emoji. Any Christmassy emoji is cool. Let me know what you're doing for this season, for your, for the winter solstice. How are you celebrating? Do you celebrate Christmas? I'd love to hear all about it in the comments box below. So do let me know. Also do let me know what you enjoyed about this video. If you have anything else to add or share, please put it below because I think it's really, really lovely to share our wisdom and knowledge and understanding and what we've been reading and what we're growing into and learning. And I think we can always learn from others. We can always learn more, no matter how much experience and how much we've read and how much we've done and where we've been. I think we can always learn more from others. And so I really, really would like to try to nurture that kind of spirit of growth and understanding and learning and developing within the community so that, you know, it's not just like, I know all this and this is what's right, this is what's wrong. I do want you to take everything I've said here with a pinch of salt. I am one person doing my reading and coming to my conclusions about what I've read. That's another reason why I love Ronald Hutton's work because his work is rooted in historic fact. He's looking at what was written, but that doesn't mean to say that everything that's in his book is fact because even he says he doesn't know. <laughs> so that's, this is the thing, it's the nuance around all of these Sabbaths that's so, so beautiful. And in a sense, I'm kind of concluding a little bit here, this whole journey we've been on this year, really diving into the Sabbaths. And as I said, I do want to continue because I want to complete my Llewellyn Sabbath series collection and learn more each time the wheel turns. It's an opportunity to learn, it's an opportunity to grow, it's an opportunity to try something new, to develop. But yeah, if you don't want to do anything either, this is the perfect time to just go within, to be still, to be silent, to sit in the dark, to be with yourself in solitude. And if there's struggles and pain, I want you to know that I send my love to you.
really sending you that love and thank you so much for joining me if you did enjoy the video please click the like button don't forget to subscribe click the little notification bell to be notified when i create and upload videos just like this also i have a patreon page where i upload custom book of shadows pages based on some of the rituals and recipes that i share here on this channel i also share new and full moon forecasts along with aspects what the planets are doing how that is impacting upon us how you can kind of work with some of those aspects if they are benefic or malefic ritual ideas and practices that you can work on at that time herbs and crystals to work with as well as a custom made tarot spread for that lunation and you can use those spread prompts as journal prompts i also add journal prompts for shadow work etc throughout the forecast as well usually as well so it takes a lot of time and energy and love and i do it for the love of it to be honest with you i've been learning hellenistic astrology for a while and it's a passion of mine it's a very intuitive process and i have heard it's quite valuable if you want to get on on that there's one tier available on patreon and you can join wherever you are i wish you the most beautiful and joyful holiday possible stay safe and well and i look forward to seeing you again really soon Take care, many blessings. Bye. We can make little outfits for them. Yeah, mummy. Yeah, so they can be all made. Especially if you love no witches right now. I love pumpkins, yeah. There's no witches. Everything is witchy. <laughs> <laughs>